Hey guys, if you're not a Star Wars fan, switch off now. Um, this is a review of The Mandalorian Season 2, Episode 1, and boy, me and Kiki were stupidly excited about this. Now, uh, for the astute observers, you'll see that I did review uh, some of the episodes, or most of the episodes, the first series of The Mandalorian. We got them much later here in the UK than uh, many of our Americans did. I ended up giving Season 1 a sort of, I think, 60 or 70 out of 100 as a sort of general sort of grade. I, it wasn't that I didn't like it. I did like it. I liked the battered realism. I loved Vern. Herzog. I like the design and style of the Mandalorian. I love the child. I love the child. Um, and I loved a lot of elements in it, but it was very, I did find elements of it quite simple. And I was reminded how Star Wars was originally developed and devised by George Lucas for 11 year olds, albeit that it, it appeals to those people like me in their 40s and 50s who were once 11 year olds and for whom it's quite a nostalgic hit. So there was lots I liked. I really enjoyed the final episode of season one. I think that was directed by uh, Taika Waititi. Um, and I was slightly frustrated all the way through that we didn't get to see a bit more of the Mandalorian's face played by the wondrous Pedro Pascal. Um, so that was a bit frustrating, but uh, Kiki watched the season and I have to say her enthusiasm and seeing it through her eyes uh, made me reappraise it and be less sort of severe about it. So, you know, we were coming to episode one of season two, full of expectation, full of excitement. And I quite liked in the first series the way in which e each episode had a sort of self-enclosed episodic sort of task or mission or quest, if you like. Kind of reminds you of the fact that Jon Favreau, the creator and the writer and the sort of brain behind this, was a huge Dungeons & Dragons fan. And there's something about it that reminds me of, does anyone else remember the cartoon series of Dungeons & Dungeons and Dragons and you'd have that sort of episodic closure even though the idea behind role playing and all that is that it goes beyond just sort of like a neat sort of one hour um, but this has that they're sort of neatly composed structured delineated stories and this first episode was absolutely that we got a little kind of um Re reminder a retelling of where we were up to and then we were immediately into a sort of dark and sort of urban setting with the Mandalorian walking with the wonderfully sort of hoverboardy sort of floating pram slash crib that the child sits within. I love the fact that the child or as some people affectionately call it Baby Yoda, though of course it's not Yoda, I realise now, because uh, this is set after Return of the Jedi. So I, I love the way in which uh, the child or something called the child is the same age 50 or thereabouts, as people like me, my generation, who came to Star Wars when we were children. So there's something kind of clever about that. Um, so anyway, so we go into this urban setting and we're quickly into a brilliantly sort of it, reminiscent of the, the scenes in Jabba's palace, you know, Jabba the Hutt, uh, the G Gamorrean guards all fighting, you know, having a sort of um, with their axes in a sort of boxing ring and there's all the crowds around them. I have to confess, I wasn't entirely convinced by the one-eyed character. I felt the sort of either the CGI or the puppetry in his eye was a bit literal. So I wasn't particularly convinced by him. But then it sort of developed into a quick ransom fight. And, you know, there was a fight about whether who was going to win and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, this sort of one-eyed hopeless freak as I call him, uh, was left hanging, wasn't he, at the end of that scene, <laughs> just before the, the title of The Mandalorian, and then all those dark red eyes kind of surrounded it and came out and ate it. So I quite like that. And I think, I hope this season pushes more towards us seeing and knowing that people die. Because sometimes I think the danger with Star Wars is that the stormtroopers never hit their targets. You don't really feel people are actually dying. And I, I got a sense of that in the first season that, you know, OK, you know, I really want to know that people are dying. And uh, I think the one eyed guy definitely got eaten. So that's kind of cool. So we arrived back in Tatooine. Can't get enough of Tatooine. I mean, the design, the sort of dustiness. The Western, they were really ramming home the Western with the bars and people waiting outside the sort of storefronts and having that sort of one main drag down the middle. I thought it was really riffing on that whole Western concept. Um, the only part of that whole tattoo and arrival that I really hated, the mechanic. I can't bear that. I hate to name an actress, but I can't bear that character. I, I just don't find her very convincing. I, sort of, I feel she's trying too hard. So I find the mechanic really annoying. So they go into the bar. Um... And then this other Mandalorian ar arrives, but he's not a Mandalorian. He's the Marshal dressed in Boba Fett's bloody armour. And of course, for anyone of my generation, Boba Fett's armour is emblematic with that brilliant sort of 
uh, almost martini olive green, I'd call it, of, of his helmet and all that. But the thing is, when he was standing in the doorway, did anyone else think he looked like he'd been dressed by his mum? It, it so didn't suit him. He was so narrow. He had no hips. It didn't fit. I mean, I'm sure they must have been joking. I mean, he looked ridiculous, didn't he? And I couldn't work out if he was meant to look ridiculous. But anyway, so we discover he's the Marshal. What did you think of the Marshal character? I thought he was quite a good actor. I quite liked him. But again, I was frustrated because he took his helmet off. He took his Boba Fett helmet off. We saw his face. I thought there would have been a good opportunity there, opportunity there for Pedro Pascal to pull his helmet off and for us to see his face. But anyway, um, and then suddenly this alarm goes off and the alarm goes off and suddenly we've got this sand shark or this kind of dragon, this kind of sandy, sharky, big jawed, a bit like Dune, really, but like, not a worm, but like a sand shark. And it kind of comes through the middle of the town and, you know, you see the sand rippling. And I thought that was really good. I thought it was really well done. It didn't feel like a TV show's special effects. It had real kind of cinema cinematic cgi about it so i really bought into it and the way it sort of rippled through the town and then ended up eating one of the bantha as as bait a huge bantha now what what the hell have they been using to make those bantha come to life do you think there were real elephants under them or have they used something else but they're really good at the bantha are amazing but anyway so the bantha eaten Whew. So then there develops this story, and this is what I quite like. You know, you either sign up to this or you don't sign up to this. This idea that within each episode there's a sort of individual task or quest. And what happens is the Marshal challenges the Mandalorian to help him and the local community to eradicate this sand shark or this sand dragon or this thing, this crate dragon, is it, or something that lives in the lives in the uh, in the mountains or in the in the desert. But they have to corral the support of the Tusken Raiders. And I loved the Tusken Raiders from the first ever Star Wars film. They were really evocative. I remember when I first saw the film when I was about seven, eight, thinking, oh, my God, what are these creatures? And do you remember there's that scene where they really scare Luke or and, and the R2-D2 falls over? And they're really, they seem really aggressive. Now, if I had one disappointment with this episode, I felt that in them working with the Tusken Raiders or the Sand People, it kind of diminished their menace. I always saw the sand, uh, the Tusken Raiders as really a p potentially mystical and barbaric people that you just couldn't quite get your head around. And they were just kind of, whoa, what are these kind of strange sort of metal tusks and bandages and all that kind of stuff. And I found that this episode kind of humanised them a bit too much. The fact that they were cooperative. Now, of course, they were cooperative because they were all agreeing that they wanted to kill this crate dragon or whatever it was called. But I don't know why, it kind of... It neutered a little bit a part of the myth for me because I always want to think of the Tusken Raiders and their, and their bantha in the sort of hills of the desert forever only sort of championing their own causes and not really wanting to, to negotiate but then again I suppose you know on Tatooine you've got the Jawas you've got everyone kind of trying to work together you've got this sort of you know elements of cooperation so that, I guess that's kind of real. At some point in, in this episode you get the Marshal telling his backstory of how he got um, Boba Fett's suit and um, in fact uh, a, a, a friend of ours uh, Dale Ibbotson uh, drew our attention to the fact that the droid when Marsh the Marshal's telling his backstory and he's in the sort of trash collector with the Jawas that the droid is the droid that blows a fuse when Luke's uncle wants to do it goes to buy him and then decides not to buy him so there's some nice back references front references forward references and all that kind of stuff and that's obviously where the Marshal gets Boba Fett's suit. So it leads you, you know, Boba Fett's in the back of this. Boba Fett is very much in the back of this. And Boba Fett was one of my favourite characters when I was young, because I remember meeting a guy dressed as Boba Fett outside a toy shop, and I was convinced I'd met Boba Fett. Bless me. I didn't realise that cosplay was a thing, even in the mid to late 70s. So then we go into this great sort of very prolonged sort of final sequence, about 15, 20 minutes of them attacking the, the, the crate dragon, trying to sort of devise ways of doing it. And within the way in which they manage to dispatch this creature, there's lots of special effects, there's lots of attempts, some Tusken Raiders get taken, a banth is used as bait. They attach all of this kind of uh, explode, all these explosive devices to a bantha. And at one point it was very much, it was reminding me a little bit of the final scenes of Jaws, you know, when they get the... Uh, the air canisters in the mouth of the of the shark and then they fire at it and then it blows up. I was thinking they're going to have to do something similar here. And interestingly, they end up doing exactly something similar in which the crate dragon lands on a bantha with all these explosives. Uh, the Mandalorian's also in there, goes in, and then it explodes the creature from within. And of course, what that does is it gives you a little insight as to how, potentially, 
this mystical character in the final shot of this episode, who could be, according to some Dale, could be Boba Fett. How, if it was Boba Fett at the end of the film, at the end of the programme, how he could have survived? Because don't forget, he fell into that awful creature out of the sort of hovering thing at Jabba the, Jabba the Hutt's palace, didn't he, in Return of the Jedi. He fell into that, I forget what it's called, that sort of mouth, the pustulating mouth in the sand. So perhaps the Mandalorian's escape from this creature was a clue as to how Boba Fett would have escaped from that creature in Return of the Jedi, which happened before the Mandalorian. Which leads us to who is that bald character at the end? Is it Boba Fett? Is it Jango Fett? Is it a completely different Fett? Is it Fett Fett? What Fett is it? Is it a Fett? Who's the Fett? Anyway, some beautiful kind of double sun sunsets and all that kind of stuff going on. A lot of chopping up of the meat of the dead dragon creature, sand creature. And this was a great episode. It was a really meaningful one hour, you know, good old schoolboy action comic book back to that original idea that the original Star Wars was of space opera but also Flash Gordon. You could imagine this as a Saturday morning adventure entertainment romp and that's exactly what this was and the Mandalorian flies off into the distance but meanwhile we've got this shadowy figure walking towards us. Is it Boba Fett? Could it be Boba Fett? I kind of hope it is because there's been all this talk about a Boba Fett standalone film. What do you think guys? I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a great start to the new series. For more film and family fun, don't forget to click the subscribe button and make sure to click the bell to never miss an update.